In an increasingly interdependent world, global shocks similar to the pandemic will be far more likely. For example, the world currently faces growing crises in climate and nature. This year, countries across Europe and around the world have also felt the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And so it is vital that we use what we have learned from the pandemic in dealing with these and other emergencies. I don't think anybody expected there to be a pandemic, but one was inevitable. I think the issue now going forward as we emerge from the pandemic we've had is how are we better prepared for the shock to the system? And that applies to any global shock. That's what I hope we are able to discuss in a non-judgmental fashion and learn some lessons that will be useful to every citizen and to all of society and not just in Scotland. So when I look back, I, I see enormous scientific discovery. I see resilience in families, in businesses, in children and adults. And I've met a host of people who have gone that extra mile to both care and treat and look after our population. I don't think you could overestimate just how traumatic the pandemic has been for people in care homes and their relatives. I think there was an assumption that once people are in a care home, that their husbands, their wives, their daughters, their mothers, it's, it's just not as important. But we were more important than any carer. In social care, responding to the pandemic was like racing the tides up the sand. But instead of wet or dry feet, you were racing for life or death. So what's needed of us now is to rebuild from scratch, not build and repair. We need a new system, a system that's based on the plurality of responses that people need, not what the establishment thinks they should get. Economic shocks, including the recent COVID-19 pandemic, typically widen inequalities. And we're seeing that once again with the cost of living crisis. So how to build resilience into our economy must be a priority in the years ahead. Likely reforms will come from many avenues, whether it be in the safety net provided during troubled times or tackling the root causes of inequalities from the outset. You've got to be ready to prepare for if you like, unknown unknowns. Uh, and I think, you know, I think the pandemic has taught us a lot of lessons about resilience and how to cope with these shocks. We need to learn the lessons clearly from what we've done up until now and prepare and be more resilient as a country as we look ahead to the shocks that will come. We won't know from where, but they will come. Good afternoon uh, to those of you attending this event uh, in person, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening <laughs> for those of you joining us online. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you on behalf of the School of Interdisciplinary Studies from the University of Glasgow Dumfries Campus, where we are speaking from today now. My name is Carlos Tino, and I'm the head of the School of Interdisciplinary Studies. Today's event is entitled Responding to a Pandemic lessons we can learn from communities and is part of the University of Glasgow's Future Global Shock series of events. This session has been developed in partnership with the Campaign for Social Science and the Scottish Council of Global Affairs. It is a well-known fact that local communities are in the front line of response when natural or man-made hazards affect a region or a country. All of us rely on family members, <laughs> neighbours, the rural village, town, or city community, when we are affected by these hazards. And this was and remains the case during the COVID-19 pandemic. When mobility was restrained, it is our social networks that kick in to provide immediate support to the most vulnerable in our community. And it is when these social networks are weak, inexistent, or inaccessible, for a variety of social, economical, control reasons, that hazards impact 
can turn more easily into disasters. Linked to the COVID-19 pandemic, research from the National Center for Resilience, which is hosted by the University of Glasgow on our campus, investigated, among other topics, the resilience capacity in young people with additional support needs and the benefits of mutual aid and third sector groups in response to the emergency. Findings indicated that the challenges presented by the pandemic prompted extraordinary responses from many communities across Scotland. There was a clear resurgence in the sense of local community with an unprecedented level of mutual aid organizations set up across the country. Another example taken from another type of hazard, an extreme snow event. One such event affected the UK, Scotland and our region early in 2018. Researchers from the National Centre for Resilience and from the School of Interdisciplinary Studies showed that survey respondents who were asked where they would go for information about heavy snow if there was a warning of it, ranked friends, family and neighbours in the top five of the list of information sources put to them. There are many examples like these around the world. Yet, interestingly, more most of the uh, assessment frameworks that attempt to quantify risks to hazards such as those I just mentioned do not capture well the critical role local communities and social networks play in increasing the coping capacities and the resilience of individuals and societies facing these hazards. More efforts are therefore required to capture systematically the roles local communities and grassroots organizations play in increasing our resilience to global shocks. Here at the University of Glasgow Dumfries campus, we have expertise across health and well-being, education, environmental science and sustainability, and tourism, areas that have all been significantly impacted by the pandemic over the last two years. Professions linked to these subject areas have seen unprecedented change throughout the pandemic, and it is for this reason that it is more important than ever that we develop graduates who are ready to tackle the biggest challenges. They would then be able to continue playing key roles at the community level to support efforts to anticipate and cope with future crises. This seminar series is very timely and will allow us to understand better the mechanisms we could put in place locally, nationally and internationally to further enable communities to increase their resilience to local and global shocks, while also recognizing that a combination of government and non-government actors in partnerships with these communities and grassroots organizations is required to achieve this goal. I therefore very much look forward to today's discussion. I would now like to introduce uh, the moderators of this session. Jim Freeman, OBE, has been working in public policy and service for over 30 years. Initially involved in youth organizations, she established a social enterprise working with employers and ex-offenders before a period as firstly a senior, senior civil servant in the Scottish government and then a political advisor. The former minister who saw through the founding legislation and delivery of social security in Scotland, she was Scotland's health secretary throughout the COVID pandemic. Jean has also worked in the private sector and held a number of public appointments linked to criminal justice and health. Jean currently works with the University of Glasgow in public health innovation and community engagement, and is a, a honorary professor at Queen Margaret University. Michael Russell is professor in Scottish culture and governance at the University of Glasgow. He was MSP for almost 20 years and a member of the Scottish government for much of that time, serving for five years as cabinet secretary for education, as well as environment minister, culture minister, and lately as a cabinet secretary for the constitution and external affairs. During the pandemic, he took responsibility for Scottish COVID regulations and legislation. Prior to politics, he was a writer and television director, is a columnist for The National, and is currently working on a book on Scotland and Brexit. So, Jean and Michael, over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, thanks very much, Fabrice, and uh, hello from me. I just want to say a few words about the point of the whole Global Shock series before we get in to uh, this afternoon's discussion. Um, the essential idea about it is that Scotland has faced a number of global shocks in recent times, from the financial crash in 2008, Brexit itself, of course, the COVID pandemic, and right now, uh, as well as 
a continuing climate uh, change challenge, right now the whole issue around energy and cost of living. So the thinking was, well, what have we learned during all of those in different ways? What do we need to do to help our country, the communities, the country as a whole, be more resilient for the next global shock that is going to come our way? I have no idea what it's going to be, but we know for sure there will be one. So that's the purpose of the whole Global Shock series. We've had two so far, the first on health, the second on social care. Today is the third, and there are three more to come, and Mike will say a bit more about those later on. Already, a lot of ideas have come forward, already really good conversations, both in person and online. I think it's probably fair to say that even at the end of this series, there is more to do. But the intention is as we go, we're writing up each of the se different seminars, looking for common threads and propositions that Scotland could be more resilient. And at the end of that, we will publish uh, what has come out of the six uh, seminar series. And then we'll see what we need to do after that. But this is part three of what I think is a really important conversation. And absolutely right that it is um, in the spirit of uh, universities and academia that our approach is one that is non-judgmental but it's about learning and then looking to see what we need to do next. Thank you very much Jean and, and, and thank you Fabrice and thank you Jean and thank you Graham for setting the scene for today. It is a, an enormous pleasure to be back at the Crichton and, and back in this particular building. I was recalling uh, when I arrived about half an hour ago that in I think at the end of 1999, I gave one of the first public lectures that this university hosted. Um, uh, and it's a delight to be back and associated very closely with the University of Glasgow, for whom I've been working on and off for the last seven or eight years. Um, uh, the purpose of the events Jean and Fabrice have outlined well. I want to thank the Scottish Council on Global Affairs, the recently formed hub for research and policy informed nonpartisan debate on international relations and global politics for their involvement in these events. And indeed, Peter Jackson, the director of the center, will speak at the next of the events, which will be held in 10 days time. And we also have been working in partnership with the Campaign for Social Science, which highlights the value of applied social science research and advocates its greater use in decision-making and in government, something that as an ex-minister, I heartily endorse. We have a very distinguished panel here, focusing on the issue of community. And it was certainly my view, um, uh, having been a local representative, as Jean was during the pandemic, that enabling and supporting communities was one of the most important tasks that we had to do uh, during the whole intense period of the pandemic. And we will consider that amongst other issues as we go through uh, this session. We, will, we have three speakers, Professor Russell Griggs, Lorraine McGrath, and Pippa Milne. Let me start with um, a Russell Gates, who is a, an old friend, if I might put it that way. I was saying to him earlier, too, that it's always great to see somebody's CV in front of you. You learn so, lots of things about them that you never knew. And although I, I did know that uh, Russell chairs South of Scotland Enterprise, and prior to that was chair of the South of Scotland Enterprise Partnership, the body that uh, created South of Scotland Enterprise, I knew that he chaired and still chairs the Scottish Government's Independence Regulatory Review Group. I even knew that he advised on better regulation in Scotland and chairs the Scottish Mines Restoration Trust. I didn't know that he is a, an independent director on the oversight board for the Controller and Auditor General for the States of Jersey, which sounds like a nice gig if you can get it, I have to say. <laughs> in 2008, he was awarded the OBE and the Queen's Birthday Honours List, and he is the independent external reviewer to the five clearing banks in the UK. He's an honorary professor at the University of Glasgow, um, was awarded an honorary doctorate by the university in 2002. He's been an associate professor at Boston <coughs> University and is a member of the board of the business school at Georgia Southern University. And he is also very welcome here today and I look forward to hearing what he has to say. That's all. As Mike said, I'm chair of this afternoon of South of Scotland Enterprise, and those of you who don't know, South of Scotland Enterprise is the economic development agency for the South of Scotland, covers the borders and increasing housing. And we started on the 1st of April 2020, so you can imagine what my story is about. 
So on the 17th of March, 2020, I was sitting in my office looking forward to my first board meeting, my new board, the start the organization. We had come to an agreement with Scottish government that this would be a slow startup. We would just go out to understand what our population wanted, start to build up all the stuff that we needed to do over the first year, so that by the end of the first year, we could get into that, and then my phone rang. And it was somebody from the first minister's office saying, um, you've got a board meeting tomorrow. Yes, I said, I've got a board meeting tomorrow, but would you mind not having it physically? And I said, why? And they said, well, you've seen, I said, yes, I've seen all of this stuff about COVID in the newspapers, that was fine. And I didn't know what we brought about it, so I didn't. So after much pleasant argument, I will call it, with the person on the other end of the phone, we agreed not to have it. And it's interesting that time scale, because on the 17th of March, we were still having those arguments. On the 23rd of March, we, we had the first lockdown. So the time shrinkage at that time about how things went from us all still arguing about it to getting to the point where it went, but I'm very, very shocked even in time. So we agreed, we had our first board meeting virtually, but we started the organisation on the 1st of April 2020, and in line with what we've done, we have one chairman, me, 10 board members, an interim chief executive, two directors, and seven members of staff, which was fine, so we all said we could go and start a slow climb to the future. And then I got another phone call from the Scottish Government to say, um, communities and businesses are going to have a real tough time during COVID, we'd like to give out all this money, and um, we're giving out all over Scotland. And he went, well, yeah, of course we will, that's what we're here to do. So 19 of us, and I'm very proud of those 19, did that. So what was the difference between what we were going to do and what we actually did and what COVID caused? One thing, and one thing really more than anything else, was that we got to know our customers and our communities very, very quickly. Because in the end, we supported about 700 communities and businesses across the south of Scotland. We did that in a three or four month period across, across that period. And it really did get us to know what we are, sorry, what they were and what their issues were and what they wanted us to do. But on the other hand, we had stopped doing everything else we wanted to do because the government said you could do nothing else. But other than this one to COVID, because all this thought you got with the the economy, wait until all that's gone. But it really did help us to do that. So we were a virtual organization for the first 18 months. So we had every board meeting online, of which we had 43 during that COVID period. We recruited every member of staff online. I replaced my chief executive online. So we became a virtual business. And we developed a virtual cu culture, which we're now having to get out of. And I'll explain that in a minute, as we did that. So it really, COVID provided us with a really interesting experience digitally on how you create a business in that environment, how you respond to your customers. And we wouldn't have done that without COVID. We would have gone up a nice, smooth curve of doing that everything we wanted to do. We learned an awful lot. We learned an awful lot about our businesses, we learned an awful lot about our communities, we learned an awful lot about ourselves. And as we come out, we only had our first board meeting physically a year past September. And that's been really interesting as we started to get our staff and our board members used to being out again, if I can call it that way. Being cheeky and virtual is very different to being cheeky face to face. <laughs> um, as we have found, and a lot of my board members who have uh, been doing this for as long as I have, have forgotten. And I think people forgot a lot of what the world was like before COVID in terms of what they were doing. And therefore, we've had some interesting moments at board meetings where perhaps people have said something that you would get away with virtually, but you don't get away physically and someone might throw something across the table at you. Mm -hmm. um, if you do, but it has sort of helped us develop a different culture. And as we all come down, as all businesses are faced with, which is how we're going to operate in this hybrid world, it's difficult because we found we became much more interested in our people. So we had a lot of single mums who were really struggling through COVID, especially when they were forced, I uh, mean forced in a polite way, to do their teaching at home or something, how we put that together. So as an employer, really to help us understand that our customers and everybody else is feeling. And coming back out in that, it's, it's helped us to do that. 
But also in doing that, we've understood a lot about our communities. We're, we're not just an economic development we're a business, but for our communities we, we have. We're a very odd part of the world here. We only have four communities that are more than 10,000 people. And that's a very, very odd piece of geography. Um, there's no, nowhere else like that in the UK um, to have that low density of population in each of our communities. And what we find is, I think as somebody said earlier, our communities are astonishingly resilient during COVID, work together, um, and we just get everybody through. As they come out of it, they're kind of lost touch with themselves, and let me explain what I mean by that. Communities across Scotland and in the South definitely are looking to where they want to go in the future, and a lot of that is about understanding what the community wants. And if I take my favourite example of the community of Langham, Langham has 2,500 people and 43 different community organisations in Langham, who all have to come together to think about what Langham wants to do in the future. They were really good at doing that before COVID. They lost the ability to do that during COVID because they weren't meeting. They were meeting as individual 43 little groups, but they weren't meeting across the group. So I got an odd call at the end of COVID saying, can you come and help us speak to each other again? So we've started to do that with our communities, to start to help them speak to each other again in groups to understand where they were. And has a light changed because of COVID? Yes, it has in many ways. But I thought what really astonished me, and I've been doing this for a long time, as you probably can see, a lot of people lost their intellectual memory during COVID about how they did things before COVID. It's some, somewhere in that mix of everything that happened during COVID. That bit of my memory has gone, and I need to go to somebody to take me back and put me back into the situation that it was. That's all I really wanted to say this afternoon, to say it's been an astonishing experience building a company from nothing during, we now have 140 people during COVID virtually. I have learned an awful lot. I hate teams. <laughs> I will live with it forever um, because it's the only way I communicate with a lot of my staff. We are finding it difficult to get people not out there, but to still meet. People are still very way. But in terms of the communities we work with, and we were talking about some of the issues. I think what it's also done is make them focus in on what are the real issues in their community. And without going into the debate, we're having a, a debate where we're having some lunch about second homes, about all sorts of things where communities are now becoming worried about the young people who are going to live, etc. Et so I will finish there. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Lorraine McGrath, the Chief Executive Officer of the Simon Community in Scotland. Lorraine began her career in the NHS in mental health and has worked in health and social care throughout her career. She's held uh, a number of executive and senior leadership roles within these sectors, including uh, the Places for People Scotland Care and Support and the Scottish Association for Mental Health. She's a board member of the Coalition of Care and Support Providers for Scotland, having previously been both convener and vice convener. Having worked directly across all of the main care groups, Lorraine's current challenges are focused on combating the causes and effects of homelessness, with a vision that drives her to ensure that everyone the Simon community encounters has a safe place to live and access to the support they need. And I was particularly keen to hear from Lorraine because one of my abiding memories of the pandemic, and I've said this to her, was walking from the flat I had in Edinburgh to the parliament and back, and always uh, in the period I had it, walking past the same person who was homeless and sleeping on a bench. And then suddenly one day that person was not there. You know the person who's talking, I'm talking about. Exactly. And it was a very visible sign of the pandemic kicking in and work being done to help and support the, those who needed it most in our communities. And I know Lorraine will reflect upon that and, and other issues. So thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Delighted to be back in, delighted to, to have the opportunity to talk about homelessness and, and also about what happened um, during the pandemic. For those of you that don't know Simon's been to Scotland, we are Scotland's largest single focus organisation in homelessness. We exist solely to combat the causes and effects of homelessness. And as Meg said, uh, our ambition is that everyone that we encounter has a safe place for access to the support we need. 
we do that in a kind of end to end basis. We work from working with people who may be at risk of losing their home to prevent that loss, to working with people who are going through the transition period of experiencing homelessness in all forms of accommodation. We provide eleven accommodation sites ourselves, from emergency, immediate, rapid access accommodation through to long term supported accommodation. We also support people into and within permanent homes as they resettle and re establish a home life and a sense of life in the community. We're the largest provider of um, interventions for people experiencing or at risk of rough sleeping in the two major cities of Scotland. We're also probably work with more women experiencing homelessness than anybody else in Scotland. Um, and we now offer our own direct homes to people in Edinburgh as a new initiative as well. So we've become a landlord and a landlord for people who will not easily transition through the mainstream housing. We focus really on responding to the most extreme forms of homelessness, rough sleeping being one of them. And we will work this year with around 8,000 people the vast majority of that 8,000 will have a roof over their head while we're working with them, but it won't be a home. And that's one of the big myths about homelessness is that we see a very visible form of it in, in relation to our sleeping. But the vast majority of the 35,000 people that ask for help for homelessness in Scotland, on average every year, most of them will have a roof over their head at any given time, but that roof will not be a home. And the sharp end of the wedge, is it rough sleeping? And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today in terms of what we did in that space during the pandemic. It was a huge challenge, the pandemic hit. It was a massive challenge to all of us in our personal lives, our professional lives, um, in relation to our health and well-being, in relation to our economic activity. It was never a bigger challenge than for the, those 8,000 people that we will work with in that year that for the vast majority of them who suffered, already suffered the greatest health inequalities, the greatest financial inequalities, the greatest social inequalities that you're ever likely to encounter in any group. It is true that for in every other area, a sense of community came to the bear, and it was community responses and family responses that uh, people were able to respond to. We had a message of stay home, stay safe uh, for the people that were and were sleeping. Um, that, that wasn't a message that was that was reaching them, and even if it had, um, that would be quite a challenge. Their community were, were basically <coughs> focused around buildings based services, which closed overnight, and we knew that that was coming. And the week before lockdown, we seen an opportunity <coughs> to do something very radical and very different, and we moved really quickly in partnership with the Scottish Government to secure access to a number of hotels in Glasgow and Edinburgh and to use our past relationship with the people we support on the streets of both cities and the people that came onto the streets of both cities as a result of the pandemic to provide a safe place. I'm really grateful to the Scottish Government who acted within 48 hours to help us to respond um, and to approve funding to open those hotels. I'm even more grateful to the incredible teams and staff in our organisation and in the partner organisations that came together with us. We have, for many years in homelessness, been focusing on empowering the front line of service delivery and giving decision making and power to act and the evidence base to the people at the front who have the relationships with the people we support to devolve the decision making to them. We bore the fruit of that at the start of the pandemic because people felt able to act. They felt able to step into spaces and make things happen in a way that they'd never had before, but they felt confident and able to do that because they'd had the backing of the organisation and they'd had the backing of the homelessness system for quite some time before that. Local leadership is where it was at. Individuals took the bull by the horns and just made stuff happen. The notion of in, in, in institutional barriers, professional boundaries, were not swept aside in any kind of reckless fashion. But we had an absolute one team agenda where we would focus more on opportunity, the challenge and threat. So the, the opportunity we had was to offer people a safe, high quality place with wraparound care 24 hours a day in a way that we've never had before. And for that to be the same team of people who had worked with them on the street for, in some cases, many years, 
Um, you know, I can't help the smile at the gentleman that they refer to because I remember my team dancing round the hotel that that guy um, had finally accepted accommodation and, and that he stayed and has uh, continued to thrive since then. So three hotels, over 500 people through the doors in just under four months. Uh, we expected to have the hotels in place for a month. <laughs> we were there for four months and just under 500 people transitioned. Within 40 hours, we had them staffed and we started to move people in. Um, within three, four days, we almost eradicated rough sleeping in both Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, and that was just a remarkable remarkable achievement and that was largely driven by the energy, the capacity and the dogged determination of those frontline teams but also the fact that we had the existing relationship with people, we had the knowledge, we had the relationship with them and the trust with them. The other thing that changed and part of the learning was that we brought in lots of services into those hotels to offer people opportunity in a way that we've never been able to do before. And one of the other ten consequences of that, as it turns out, was that was a letting of message to people who are normally used to not having access to things, to being actively excluded from things, and to being the system messaging to them that their health doesn't matter, that their well-being doesn't matter, that What's happening for the general population is what matters, not what, what's happening for them. What we were able to do, um, and that we found in unintended ways, is that by focusing on their health and well-being during that period and being able to exploit the opportunity we have with them, frankly, it was an opportunity. We didn't very often have that captive audience that we were able to say, right, let's, yeah. let's look at all these other things. We had school nurses coming in getting vaccinations. The general vaccinations that we all um, access, we had diagnostics going on from a health point of view because we were able to bring it to the hotel because there was capacity in the system to do that. And local leadership seeing the opportunity along with us to do that kind of work. We had smoke and cessation programs brought in because that reduced the risk of people going out to get cigarettes. We were able to provide people with digital access in a way that they'd never had before. Um, most of us relied on online content to keep us informed. Most of us relied on online access to keep us connected. The people we support uh, in the experience of sleeping don't have those kind of access arrangements. And even if they had a device, they didn't have the data access. And all the places where free Wi-Fi were available were gone. So that was a really important access as well. The amount of messaging to each and every element of that the food provision, the quality of the environment, the standard of the staff, layered upon layered upon layered message of you do matter, we do care, your health is just as important as anybody else's. And also just that shared understanding of this is what is happening when you don't have access to TV, online content, or any other messaging so that you could understand what's happening in the world. All that a lot of the guys that we were supporting you is that they, could no, they had no longer anywhere to go during the day. The services that they usually accessed for life and limb support were no longer there. The, the, the opportunity that was created was enormous. In terms of the impact, it was a very human impact um, on each individual person, and we've seen dramatic and enormous changes in people um, in a very short space of time. Um, and stories upon stories that, that would um, just amaze you in terms of people being able to have the privacy of accessing their own shower in a room for the first time, um, people reconnecting with family, people accepting uh, accommodation for the very first time, in some cases in 20 plus years. Um, and that really gave us the opportunity to do intensive case management for all of those individuals as well as the people who we weren't able to bring in, and they were very small in number. It was like single numbers in, in Glasgow, and no more than 15 in Edinburgh at any given time, having previously been over 100. What we learned is that that empowerment of the front line 
is consistently important, not just at times of global shock, but even more so. Because if it's there all the time, people feel empowered for it. And they know what to do, and they know how to come together. Local leadership is really important. Big system change can sometimes come from policy and from data and evidence, but more often than not, it comes from people behaviour and people leadership. And that local leadership is incredibly important. And it's that local leadership that has sustained a lot of the, lot of the actions and a lot of the behaviours and a lot of the relationships and a lot of the understanding that was developed during that lockdown period. And that sustained us. And as of this week, we continue to have single figures Ross sleeping in Glasgow and in the teams in Edinburgh. And that has been the legacy of the pandemic. Homelessness is not a problem that's going away. We are still resolving 60 to 70 people a week and preventing them from Ross sleeping in both cities. So if we took our foot off the pedal for a second, that would change dramatically overnight. But I think the key message for me is that relational opportunity um, and don't get caught up in the policy and practice, enable the behaviours, because positive behaviours will drive system change, not just in rapid system change and emergency response, but over the long time as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. I was struck listening to you, and, and, and Jean will um, know this too, of the presentation we had at the last event from the Scottish Council on Disability, where the issue of people working together, uh, breaking down barriers, yes. and the issue of people feeling valued were things that came out of the pandemic. And I'm sure we'll return to them as we, as we discuss these matters. Uh, finally, before we come to discussion and question and answers, uh, we're going to hear from Pippa Milne, who is the Chief Executive of Argyle and Butte Council. Um, I admit to an interest in this. I was the MSP for Argyle and Butte for, for 10 years. And during the pandemic, Pippa and I spoke virtually every week uh, about the issues that the pandemic was presenting for the people of Argyle and Butte and how the Council can uh, and did assist those people with the resources that Russell was talking about that came from the Scottish Government. Pippa studied law at Aberdeen University and after graduating worked with Fife Regional Council. She's worked in local authorities in Edinburgh, Leeds, Poole, Telford and Rekin. Uh, she joined the Argyll and Butte Council as Executive Director of Development and Infrastructure eight years ago, I think, and became Chief Executive at the end of 2019. Argyll and Butte uh, is a council that stretches from Helensborough uh, to Oban, uh, from Butte to Tyree. It has 23 inhabited islands, 17% of the population live on islands, and interestingly enough, a statistic I didn't know, but it's always useful to keep learning, 80% of the population live within one kilometer of the sea. Uh, so it is a very remote and rural area. I'm delighted to live there, and I was very pleased to work so closely with Pepper during the pandemic. I look forward to hearing what she's got to say. Thanks, Michael, and um, it, it was a pleasure to work with you, and I think um, you know, to, to work with our government did um, alongside uh, Scottish government and the funding we were able to um, to deliver in um, from Scottish government um, and to distribute on their behalf was transformational for our communities. So a bit like Russell, I was um, a relatively new chief exec. I took up post in January 2020. I had a great plan I touted at my interview that I was going to deliver for the organisation um, and clearly that changed significantly um, by the time we got to March 2020. Again, a bit like Russell, um, things were moving pretty fast. I'd gone off on holiday. My husband and I were in a rented um, motorhome on the Isle of Harris. Um, that started off a lovely idyllic holiday. By the uh, middle of that, I was holding emergency crisis meetings um, from the back of a camper van in, in a relatively remote area. So um, things change pretty fast. And we sometimes think of, of large, large organisations like um, councils, ours is 5,000 staff over the very large area that Michael talked about as, as being super tankers um, that are difficult to shift. Um, I think we showed that we kind of transformed that super tanker into a, a nimble little uh, speedboat that was doing the equivalent of donuts um, around the area to, to respond to what we were dealing with. 
just in that first uh, week where we saw the real shift, we closed all our schools, we shut down non-essential services, we refocused all our resources to the response for the pandemic. 1,500 office-based staff um, moved to home working overnight. Uh, we changed all our governance structures and decision making and, and we started the big um, task of supporting vulnerable people, those self-isolating um, and those businesses that needed uh, financial support distributed to them. So we're a democratic organisation. Um, we very much have decision making made by our elected councillors that are representatives of our communities and it was important to maintain that link. Those councillors were still providing valuable insight into what was happening in communities um, across that wide area. It's a very different experience in each of those communities. So we shifted to online and to very nimble, agile, um, frequent meetings, quite directive in terms of the objectives we were trying to achieve, but trying to allow for um, distributed um, and empowered um, implementation that was relevant to those different um, communities um, so that we could deliver bespoke solutions across the area. And that needed us all to work in a trusting um, environment. In terms of caring for people, I think one of the things that our teams reflect on is we had a very clear mission of what we were trying to deliver. Um, and a bit like Lorraine, that coalesced people around a shared goal uh, and broke down um, any previous barriers or silos in terms of how people work together. We essentially created a new service within three days. We went out to our staff, asked what their strengths were, not what they normally did in their J job, but what their strengths were in whatever part of their life. And we worked based on the relationships that we already had with partner organisations, be it the police, fire, coast guard, third sector interface, and most importantly, our community organisations. We were very clear in a large area like ours. We couldn't deliver everything that needs to be delivered um, ourselves. We had to work in supporting community organisations to enable them um, to help their own communities as well. So that, that relationship point was, was really important for us too. And providing visible leadership to support that. So on a virtual basis, as we all work, our teams were meeting weekly with over 100 community groups spread across the whole area, sharing information, helping to identify their needs and helping to address and overcome the issues they were facing um, on delivering services at a local level. And that's something that we have conti continued beyond the pandemic and to continue to invest in those human relationships. We certainly got a, a, an aging demographic in our Dallin view and a reducing population. So supporting the capacity in those groups you know, who, who actually finished the pandemic um, you know, quite tired um, and still, but still with communities needing um, that help and support. So that support, we offered um, a hub and a, a, a helpline essentially that was able to link uh, people to pathways for um, formal health and care um, delivered by the NHS and the Health and Social Care Partnership, to welfare rights advice, um, support with food, um, deliveries of food, uh, pharmacy. Um, but we got down to what are we going to do with my pet when I go into hospital? How do I repatriate that person that was visiting um, the Isle of Mull and now isn't allowed on a ferry um, to get back? Where are they going to stay? and all sorts in between. Um, and we also discovered a great deal of, um, of hidden vulnerability that previously hadn't become clear to any of um, the support organisations in the area. And again, that is a, a continuing legacy of how do we continue to use that information, design services and support those people that previously wouldn't have come forward and wouldn't have felt it was appropriate to ask for help. Similarly, in terms of business support, we have a lot of small, medium-sized enterprises and micro-businesses, um, very reliant on tourism. Clearly, tourism stopped overnight. 
Um, and we were very clear early on once the government announced the, the business grants, which were a lifesaver for our economy, that in, immediately we went on the principle of maximising um, the amount of funding that we could leave in for those businesses and where we could provide um, discretion within the criteria we were given, we applied discretion and we were very clear with all the teams that were distributing that. Um, and we were successful because of the speed we were able to get that, um, that money out. Again, relationships because we used our economic development team who knew businesses, we used our business gateway team who worked with a lot of those businesses, we used our revenues and benefits teams who were used to distributing financial support, and we used our internal audit team who were used to um, applying those processes and make sure we still had the audit trail that, that we needed at the end of that. Um, and we, we introduced our own internal review process to make sure that we were being true to those objectives. So that enabled us to distribute over 4,000 grants the value of over 40 million pounds across the area. So you can imagine how transformational that was in keeping businesses uh, alive in the area. And then I think one of the other key things was applying it, an adaptive leadership approach. So we wanted to make sure that we had proportionate approaches. So we're still governed by a lot of the same audit and best value principles that we would have to um, uh, be able to justify uh, post the pandemic, but we wanted things to be um, proportionate to that and, and just enough and not too much process. We needed to be able to redeploy staff without going through massive change of contract. We needed to redeploy them into other areas, make sure they were safe in doing that, but that we weren't slowing that down. Similarly for how we could use volunteers to do that. So make sure that our teams weren't going back to perhaps the way that we would normally do that, that was um, sort of time consuming and often um, accused of, of bureaucracy, um, but we're able to respond to that quickly. We weren't afraid to change the way services are delivered. So schools closed very quickly. Our school kitchen staff were delivering uh, hot meals to young people who would have otherwise had free school meals and doing welfare checks to make sure they were okay. But we also found very quickly not everybody was accessing that sport. Clearly, a lot of young people lived a distance away from school. So not everybody was, was wanting that particular support. So we looked at also not just how we could provide what we felt was a really high quality solution, but how we could get maximum reach. And that shifted to also providing the food parcels to those families so that we could give them um, the ingredients to make the meals that they needed recipes and support of how they could do that and also create an activity so that families could actually entertain the kids that were, were now at home 24 7 and then eventually moving to a vouchers based system as, as the situation moved on so i think you know that being prepared to continue to question and assess the value and impact of, of what we were doing i think the other thing we reflected on in terms of of our area was both as an organisation, the fact that we had a lot of staff who were um, working long hours at frenetic pace to deliver on the pandemic, but we had a lot of people who were at home and had a very different experience, and even some of our elected members, you know, who felt that they weren't able to, uh, to do as much as they would want because they were in lockdown and, and we were having to uh, to focus on, on that delivery at a really fast pace. So understanding that people's experience was very different and communicating what was happening, how people could help and what was going on um, was equally important. And equally for our communities of how that felt um, and how we could respond to that. So you know, I can think of a number of examples. If anyone knows Luss on the banks of Loch Lomond, as lockdown started to ease, Loss was the place a lot of people in Glasgow went and trying to balance what we saw as managing a massive influx from outside the area with the sensitivities of that community with a lot of elderly people and how they would feel about what was happening and how we could listen to that and being aware of, of that. Mm. Likewise on our islands at times they were indifferent, if you remember the sort of 
the, uh, the levels that we were all in, in terms of freedoms and flexibilities that we could um, exercise, they were in lesser levels. How did they feel about um, things opening up and, and how did they want to be relative to, to mainland areas and trying to engage um, with them and, and maintaining that communication and knowing that ex that experience was very different. Even within those island communities, there were very different views and also very aware that our staff um, are part of our community as well and their well-being. So they were experiencing the challenges with family, um, illness, um, and, and working different ways in a very stressful situation. But in actual fact, what we found was staff absence overall went down. Um, people were very um, coalesced around a, a strong mission and the reinforcement they saw for the impact of the work that they were doing. But we focused massively on their well-being and showing that we valued their well-being through the pandemic. And again, that we have continued um, that focus in a way perhaps we, we didn't um, give it quite the um, the high profile that we did before. And I think that has paid off massively. So in terms of taking some of the learning, we're trying to apply some of that in terms of our um, ongoing change program. So very clear about the benefits of having that very clear um, vision and mission in what we do. If you can get people co coalescing around that shared vision, um, then it's much easier to have um, greater empowerment of our teams and we want that across a wide area. We want them to be able to um, innovate and deliver in a way that is relevant to, to local communities. Um, since Lorraine mentioned um, sort of one council approach, we want to break down silos, we want people to work in partnership. Sometimes I say it's actually not one council approach, it's a one area approach, so that goes across all our public sector partner um, organisations. And as a remote rural area, we're quite lucky we have a very strong partnership working with um, organisations because we have to in a lot of those communities. Having good, strong data and evidence to inform what you're doing and main, means you can focus on the most impactful and make sure you're having the impact that, that you want to. Being agile so we can respond to those things. As Jean said, we're, we've had the pandemic, I think. You know, if I looked at our flu plan, you wouldn't have the sense of how long the response would continue if you read that document um, with what we all know now. But we've gone straight through cost of living and you know all the issues that we're fighting now without let up so being agile to respond to that and to do that home working and to uh, shift to that we were lucky our staff had good technology and they had access to email all the systems and telephony from home overnight so being technology enabled to make sure that our communities are technology enabled um, I think is, is important and in terms of trying to capture that, um, we've contributed to research, um, uh, both UK and Scottish level, and particularly in that sort of relational working space. Our approach to working with communities has been recognised by Old at Scotland um, as best practice, and we continue to look at um, assessing the lessons that we've learned and trying to apply that in normal practice. Um, but in preparing for this, I suppose one of the things I've taken away talking to, to Michael in preparation is how do we write down what it what it actually felt like and how we actually dealt with that in that personal way so that those that come for the next big shocks are able to, to fare better and be prepared for what we will dealt with. Thank you. Pippa, thank you very much, and I certainly take away from that a great deal, but the shared vision seems to be the common theme that we've heard across this platform. I'm, I'm going to unusually uh, ask the last question now and give people on the table time to prepare for it, um, and it arises out of, Pippa has just said, a discussion that Pippa and I had some time ago, where I said to her, what would be your advice to your successor for the next pandemic? because uh, with the greatest, without wishing any ill will to people in this panel, you're not going to be around forever uh, in your current positions or any other position. What do you say to the people who are going to follow you on in terms of what you've learned, uh, the big lesson that you've learned and how to take it forward? But now we are open to question and discussion. 
There are people online, but we're also looking for contributions from uh, this gathering here. So if anybody like to ask the first question or make the first point, either to an individual member of the panel or letting all of them answer. Has anybody got a point they'd like to make? It's always the awkward moment, who, who, whoever's going to be the first. We have one online. Uh, Graham, we've got an online question. Yeah, I actually got two. Mate, two. On you go. Yeah, absolutely. So, first question is to ask the panel what the number one lesson has been from, right. uh, from, from the pandemic. And then, second question that the panelists have touched on this already is we've now moved in away, or not moved away from the pandemic, yeah. but we're now dominated by discussions about the cost of living crisis. So, what lessons can we take from what we've heard there about how we did things differently into potentially another crisis on top of pandemic. Let's take that one first. I want to keep the, the, the one big lesson till the end um, and your advice. But in terms of what you have learned in from the pandemic, what are you applying now to the problems that you're facing? P Pippa, do you want to start with that? Yes, thanks, Michael. I, I, I suppose it's kind of that, that point I made at the end. So we certainly talked a lot to staff and you know, I don't think any of us would want to go through the pandemic again. I wouldn't want to ask our teams to, to do that anytime soon. But actually that point of being really clear about what we were trying to deliver, use those strong relationships that we had, trust people to go and deliver. We've got really talented teams. If you give them that clear objective and set them off to do it, they can deliver amazing stuff. I sat in the middle and coordinated, they did it all. Um, and, and so trusting um, that, I think, um, and the importance of maintaining those relationships so that if it does happen again, you know, that is what you call being able to get in a room and know you already know those people, you understand their strengths and weaknesses, um, and you, you trust each other. Is a, is you, a are, you are facing now the cost of living crisis, both as an organisation in terms of the costs you're meeting, and... You know, the people of Argyll and Butte, the, the 40 something, 50,000 or, or so of Argyll and Butte, they're facing the cost of living crisis. What, what are you doing now that you wouldn't have done before the pandemic? What has it taught you in dealing with that particular problem? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a difficult one because I suppose, in a sense, we've just, we've almost not missed a beat. We've just kept going almost in the way that we, we had. So, we had that benefit of good, strong partnership working, but actually, I suppose in the sense of, we, it's probably a confidence in the sense of, we can do anything. Because right. who, if you'd have asked me before, can you create a new service in three days? I, I'd have laughed at you, but we did that. So I think part of it is the confidence that the teams haven't missed a beat. They've just kept right. going, go, see if you, if you want us to put a new thing in, we can do that. Right. Come to you, Lou. Russell. Yeah, I, I guess thinking about it, I suppose in the short term, it would be don't worry about it, you can cope. Mm -hmm. And what that means, a huge sense of pragmatism to say that there are some things you can change and some things you just can't. And therefore, you just ignore, if you worry about things you can't change, you're not going to do anything. So I suppose the focus was on just getting things done. And that has carried over to where we are to try and avoid the noise. If I call it that, that you don't need to worry about and just focus on what it is you want to do. And I mean, we chose to speak to all our communities and businesses during the work because we've never spoken to them before. And that helped a lot. So we've learned that people can take even the worst news, but it's much better doing it through a voice than through an email. So it is about a bit of pragmatism, but also about um, talking is good, if I can put it that way. You have, a, you know, the cost of living issue is going to affect well, every business and every individual. So what what are you bringing to that practical help that you might not have done? So I, I guess what we're, we're, we're trying to do is turn every challenge into an opportunity. So if I can take it, we have one large business not far from here whose energy business is going to go from 250,000 to 1.2 million in a single bound. Um, which is a challenge to change, but what they have known though is turn that into an opportunity about how can they reduce their um, energy consumption by 30%. So it's about 
saying you can't do anything about that bit over there. What are the bits right. you can do about over here? And let's work positively towards fixing those. And I was with the person yesterday, and um, she is now very positive about the future rather than right. three months ago when she was losing a lot of sleep at night because they can see something at the end of the tunnel now because they've turned that, can't do anything about that, let's focus on the bits we can and just go after it. The, the cost of living crisis will be a big pressure on homelessness. Uh, you've been through the pandemic. You obviously told us you, you you are continuing a lot of the same activities. Are there specific things that you're doing, or or is it just what you've learned how to do out of the pandemic and knew before? Um, I think for me, the the trust issue, the trust in your teams, the trust, and not just deploying that trust at the times of crisis, but making sure it's there all the time, so that at the times of crisis, it takes care of itself. But I think for us, in terms of the risk of homelessness, the risk of homelessness is now presenting itself in communities and in households and in families where it was never experienced before. So we want and are actively taking the learning from all of the years of delivery that we have, but also the experience of the pandemic to look at how we make it easy to reach people, much easier to reach people at a much earlier stage. And where are the early warning systems opportunities to connect with people when they might not even recognise themselves yet, how great a risk they're at right. of homelessness. And even if they are, they might not realise the range of services and opportunities and support that's available to them. So it's about working through, particularly with DWP, to use their touch points with people, for instance, to reach them at a much earlier stage and, and hopefully divert and prevent homelessness for an awful lot more people who we do expect to be newly at risk. Right. Anybody got a question from here? Yes, people that have. We'll start there, please, and then they did that. Please. Uh, I'm just wondering, it's obvious that the whole structure of your management and leadership changed to a much more distributed way of processing things. And irrespective of another pandemic or another, because there's always something, isn't it? You think, oh God, when the pandemic's over, life's going to be great. Of course it isn't. Something <laughs> else happens and that's the way life is. Do you think that the, as a result of the pandemic, though, the whole system will change permanently in terms of the way you manage and you run things? You will take that on board as a, a positive state. The outcomes were good. And absolutely. Um, and in a number of ways, it's about caring for your staff. So the COVID forced us to understand a lot more about our staff as individuals, um, about where they work, how they can work, how they can work from home, etc. So we've built that now into the future. Um, it's about giving people more responsibility um, and letting them get on with things. So I think in our organisation, what has changed is we all just get on with what it is we need to do without worrying about so if I get asked by one of my staff to dig a hole, I'll go and dig a hole. Because that's what I need to do for the organisation. And I think that feeling now in the organisation that we all work for each other, if I could put it as simply as that, is something that will carry into the future. What about yours? Um, I think absolutely yes, I agree, that, but only if we do so intentionally. Because the old bureaucracies, the old professional hierarchies, <coughs> the old focus on policy and practice rather than on behaviours and attitudes and, and the making it happen. Um, it's become one of our mantras in the organisation that it's make it easy, make it right, make it happen. Um, and that came from the start of the pandemic and has stayed with us. But we have to keep the energy and in being intentional about that and not, getting, not falling back to old ways of what we can't do, but focus entirely on what we can do. In health and social care, there's always a, a, a great emphasis on an evidence-based approach, which is absolutely right, but sometimes that gets in the way of just doing stuff. Is the old way, um, <laughs> is the old way reass reasserting it's, itself? Are um, the old things? In some places, yes. Right. Yes, so we have to intentionally be very clear that we need to keep that empowerment in the hands of the people who make the greatest difference. And when you live, uh, when it's a people-led system, <laughs> And the work is very relational. It is in the hands of the frontline staff. Um, I was fortunate that we had that culture both within Simon Community Scotland and more and more so in homelessness because of the Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan. 
that that was part of the agenda. So we already had that in place, and that really largely why we were able to do what we did so quickly. Uh, similar to to the others, I mean, I think one thing we're trying to do is is keep, you know, can we be more focused, <laughs> deliver less but more quickly, and move on to the next thing? So actually, in total, we do more, and and that's hard because people kind of see the total. I, I mean, I would agree with ev everything that Russell and Irene have said. I mean, we um, also trying to keep people in terms of continual learning and questioning whether there's a better way to have the greatest impact. And that's hard because sometimes people feel that's a, a criticism, particularly when the, the frenetic pace goes. Uh, and the other thing we did was around hybrid working. So we did a lot of checking with staff. Do you, you know, is, is there benefits in hybrid working? And you know, three surveys later, yes, people feel that, you know, in terms of what that means for work and work-life balance. So we've been really intentional as well about how we get people back to the office so that it's not just, well, we've opened the doors, you know, come back in. Actually, it takes, I think Lorraine's point, it takes intent to come back and do hybrid working is to just come back in some of the time. It's a very different way of working. So we have to be really intentional and self-aware as we to try and hold on to some of those things because I think otherwise it is easy for people to start slipping back. Yeah, that, that kind of intellectual, that, that kind of um, intelligence that you talked about, that comes back because, yeah. you know, particularly in professional uh, settings where people's years of training take them yeah. back to that really quickly. Yeah. Right. And then that kind of memory kicks back. Yeah, just of course. Supplement to that. Good. To you, Michael. Good. In education, because that's what I'm working yeah. with down here with the primary course. Do you think that the education system has slipped back immediately to its old ways of hires and being the predominant way of judging of children? Have we not benefited from the fact that children achieved a different assessment techniques and we've immediately jumped back to? Looking at what hires are they going to get and I think the university is guilty as well, demanding these things. But don't you think we miss an opportunity in that that's too bad? It's a long time since I had responsibility for education. <laughs> but I would make the point that of course it, you know, an attempt to change that thinking predates the pandemic. You know, the whole idea of curriculum for excellence was not just to trust teachers, but also to make sure that we were not overvaluing uh, examinations and undervaluing uh, achievement, you know, and, and, but we are constantly moving back into that place. But society puts you in that place, puts all people in that place. And that's why, you know, a, a lot of thinking on education, radical thinking on education, I'm still very fond of and perhaps would espouse uh, more loudly now that I'm not in office than I did when I was in office. I mean, people, you know, there, there is a school of thought that believes that the, the, the genesis of Curriculum for Excellence, of course, which was a conclusion 1999 and 2000, 2001, same time as the Great Debate on Education, that there was over-examination. It was too intensive that we could do this another way. That needs to be refreshed and remembered. Uh, you know, and a number of people, Pazi Salberg and others, have written extensively on the type of education, which I certainly believe is the type of education we should see in Scotland. But it's a long time, as I say, since I had anything to do with it, and probably I'm out of touch. Michael, uh, can, I yes, of course. can I just add to that? Because I think it's an interesting one. We saw definitely teachers saying for some young people, actually learning from home suited their particular needs better yeah. and they flourished. And there is something about how we hang on to that. Because I think societally, Michael's right, there's a belief that, you know, there's a certain model. And, and we certainly, you know, like many things, we prove there are different ways of doing things because we could test change at a rate through yeah. the pandemic and, and with permission that we don't have in normal times. So it is another point, I think, of how do we yeah. kind of keep that and, and keep that bravery and courage to do some of that, which is harder in normal times. A set text for all of us should be Ivan Illich still, but it's, it isn't, of course, <laughs> because people have forgotten about de-schooling. So I'm going to bring the lady in white in who had a question and had her hand up. Yes, my question was about, sorry, this is very loud. Um, we saw how well services pivoted during COVID, um, particularly the third and statutory sector working really well together across communities, particularly in the south. It's about, have we retreated to those silos again? Are we sustaining that? 
Um, because, for instance, in Turkey and Gal, we've got an aging population, an aging care workforce. So it's in the interests of the integrated joint boards and health and social care to work collaboratively with the third sector around that because of the challenges there. And the third sector particularly can really mobilise large numbers of volunteers across communities, and that was shown through COVID, um, which, as we know, volunteers are unpaid, low cost and high impact. So it's about what we learned from COVID and how we sustain that, how we don't retreat back to the silos, and that the third sector have a, not just a seat at the table at IGBs, but also um, that they can vote you know, on decisions and be a true partner at those tables. I'm going to start with Pepper because the IGB issue is. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but we'll no, start no, with you. No, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think we have pivoted back. Um, I think, you know, certainly in my area, we, we recognise that ongoing importance of the third sector. Um, along with other partners, we have really strong relationships with third sector interface, community <laughs> groups, um, chief officer of the IJB, um, health board, chief exec, myself, other partner organisations. Um, I think some of it, th there's undoubtedly an impetus that you lose without that sort of crisis quite the same nature. But it comes back to the point we've all talked about, it's about the relationships. And I think it's a big part of it, like continuing to invest the time and energy in those relationships, because that works certainly in my area, because all of those people, we're all committed to that strong partnership working and supporting one another and looking for ways in which we can work across that whole system. I'm a strong believer that the, the transformation we'll need to achieve to deal with the challenges that, that we face and will continue to face can only be overcome by working holistically across that whole system. Um, and But you need the right people and, and you need to support and understand that. I think we need to put aside the ego of us as individual organizations. You know, I think there is such a thing as organizational ego and we need to we need to make sure we've been that and as leaders we need to exemplify that. It's not about our organization, it's about the impact we have in our communities collectively. And I, I think that does still exist. Russell and then Lynn. Lindsay, I suppose the answer is I think we have a bit. I think the reason you have a bit is during COVID, we were all focused on one thing, one output. And we just had to get on and do it. So you just mucked in and you did what you do. As the world is opening up again, we start to go back to some of the issues that we had before. Um, I think at times we're finding it difficult to apply that same single mindedness to that issue. Um, and the old agendas with a small a, et cetera, come back into play. I think it's a lot better than it was, because I think what it, what, what it did was definitely for us, as you know, um, allow us to work much more closely with our public sector and other partners in the south of Scotland, so it's here. Um, but I think we are back having some of the conversations around the third sector, some of the community planning partnership boards and things like that, for example, that we had before COVID and maybe hoped they'd go away, but they haven't. And I think that's just because it doesn't have the single focus, the single output that we have to do this right now and that we had with COVID and you're back into some of the other stuff. And we would have, so if you wanted to build a house for somebody in COVID, we'd have gone and done it. Now we'll start arguing about planning. Um, and, and it is about how we bring some of those things together. So I think a bit, I think it's a lot better, but a bit. Lynn, I'm going to take you and then I'm going to take one more from online. Uh, and then I'm going to pose my final question, which I posed 20, 25 minutes ago. Well, let's see if we get an answer. Right, uh, on you go. Uh, well, I'll speak from uh, the perspective of the third sector in health and social care. Um, I think it has come back um, because it is consistently a kind of master servant relationship in terms of funding, in terms of strategy, in terms of policy. Um, and during the pandemic, I think many organisations like ourselves got on and did things without rever reverting to the public sector to say, "Is it okay if we do this? Does it fit with the strategy? Is there fun? You know, is you know, which, which, 
um, we have to do because if we go ahead and do things that doesn't fit with the local strategy and doesn't fit with the, the you know the policy you know then we we get punished for that in, in all sorts of different ways the second thing is that the pandemic's done nothing to bring parity um, to those relationships you know um, even though we the third sector were you know nimble on its feet and and without the the capacity the drive the volunteerism all of the kind of extra mile activity that the third That's sector the got which was applauded throughout the process in lots of different ways but it has not delivered parity and it particularly hasn't delivered parity to the workforce and particularly within health and social care that we are lagging behind and we are constantly having to argue the point that you know public sector workforce doing the same jobs as voluntary sector workforce there is no parity there and that undermines a very very important part even though the voluntary sector consistent deliver higher quality um, and higher impact um evidenced by the care inspectorate for instance that's not come back and we are now back in that in that um public sector strategic planning if it's not in the plan then you can't do it and uh, as Russell has just pointed out to me, the fiscal challenges will make the lack of parity yep. worse, yes. not better. So that is to be borne in mind. But I'm going to take the online question and then I'm going to ask the panel to ask uh, the, 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 the final question uh, because we want to draw things together by half past. So a question about opportunities and particularly in rural areas, where we in rural areas did things differently, or were able to do things differently during the pandemic and what opportunities might there be to learn from that in the future long-term strategy for rural areas and addressing some of the challenges that might face around aging populations? One of the words that hasn't been used on this panel yet, which I'm a bit surprised about, is localism. I certainly thought during the pandemic, my experience locally was that localism had become very strong and that look, communities were showing resilience. For example, in Argyle Butte, there were a lot of resilience groups working locally and arranging things like common shopping being taking place. Now, I think some of us thought that would continue. I see signs that it hasn't continued in, in places that in actual fact people have reverted back to previous models. So uh, you know, as part of the, the debate, I think the issue of whether you can, uh, localism can re-emerge is going to be an issue, but uh, anybody like to contribute that paper? You, you, you. Yeah, you, I mean, I, th I think, I mean, it, it, it absolutely did because it had to. So we, as I said, it was distributed. We we relied on local groups, and and they, um, you know, they did what suited and in, in their communities. I mean, at, at some levels, we had individual communities creating their own sort of arrangements around self isolation. And if you went off island, you know, they agreed amongst themselves to protect vulnerable communities, how that would be handled and things. So. So, I mean, Microsoft, some of it in, is cheated, I think, for the reasons that I said of, you know, a lot of the, some of that sort of community action, it relies on the same people who are doing active in a lot of groups. And, and that sort of, um, you know, they were, they were tired basically at the end of the pandemic. And, and that's, you know, that's quite hard with an aging population. But there are undoubtedly examples. So, We've got things like um, Isla has carbon neutral island status and features in some of our plans so that we can try and use that as an exemplar of what's possible in a climate change perspective, for example. So it's trying to take some of those things. I think it also does come back to you know, what we've said of being brave to try things and not being afraid that um, if things go wrong, because if we're going to do all of that, we have to live with the fact that some things will work and some things won't, and that's um, and that's okay. Yeah, I, I, just a couple of things. In terms of localism, butcher shops, which were the bellwether of how much it was, their sales, because we've been watching them, have dropped back almost to where they were in COVID. Mm -hmm. So a lot of a lot of that has changed. People have started to go mm -hmm. elsewhere. And in terms of opportunities, I think the big opportunities I try to articulate in my remarks is that communities found they could do great things during COVID. And what they're now saying to us is, 
how can we do bigger things as our total community? So how can, I, how can the 43 different community organisations of Langham come together to drive that whole community forward? And that, that will take some time and it will need working on them. But they found they can do things beyond what they ever thought they could do. So now can I do something greater? Good. I think the only thing I would comment on in terms of localism is, is that communities that would have perhaps never perceived that the risk of homelessness was part of their world. The economic shock of COVID brought that sense of risk and reality to people, um, as is the ongoing cost of living crisis. So that, that really helps people understand that whilst the vast majority of people who experience long and enduring periods of homelessness, it is poverty that's at the, at the driver of that, and there will, more than half of them will have complex needs. Um, of, in health and social care needs, as well as an experience of homelessness. There is a reality there that that sense of risk and the impact that that has on your mental health and wellbeing is much more live in many more local communities that right. would not have been there before. Okay, I'm conscious of time. I'm going to draw the final question together, um, which is, imagine you are handing over to your successor. What do you say to them about what they need to take forward? Because the purpose of this, all these events in the end is to say, what lessons can we learn? And we're writing up, filming has, has taken place, we're writing up, uh, you know, we hope that we can pass these messages on. How would you synthesize your message? You start. Well, I think we always knew that it was possible to eradicate rough sleeping in Scotland. Um, so uh, my first message would be believe, believe, believe it's possible, believe anything is possible and trust yourself and trust your teams to know how to make that, how to turn what, that belief into action. Um, and, and maybe don't wait to ask for permission for absolutely everything, just go on to that. <laughs> that is the great Scottish fault, waiting for permission uh, to say. I'm going to finish with Pepper. Russell? Yeah, I, I guess mine is similar to Pepper. Uh, sorry. Is that we're all in the same boat. Um, so don't worry about who's captain. Just make sure the boat gets, needs, needs to get to where it wants to go. Um, and I think that is our biggest learning, but uh, I mean, I can recall when we started this, you know, we didn't care who went and did what it was as long as it got did. So I think that's it is, you know, so we're all in the same boat and just get on and make sure you get to the, the, the right harbour. And don't ask permission. And don't ask permission. <laughs> yeah. Unanimity. Yeah. Uh, um, so I suppose it, it would be around, you know, remember your leader on behalf of your, your communities and, and building relationships and trust. Um, with partners in those communities is the, the biggest investment you can make. And I suppose have a bit of fun, find the places in your organisation where you can go and mm. prod where, you know, the, the bizarre, stupid things kind of get stuck because that's the best fun you can have and you, it's a great way of exemplifying um, what you're trying to achieve. I must find where the bizarre, stupid things are in our Butte. I don't think, <laughs> Tell don't me, think, Michael, I don't I'll think go. you ever told me. So. <laughs> anyway, Tell look. me if you find them, I'll go and prod. <laughs> Good. Um, look, thank you, all three of you, and, and thank you for the people online, and thank you for the people who've been here. Um, this is, as Jean said, the third of six events. The next one is back in Glasgow on the evening of the 21st uh, November, and it's called Striking a Balance, Lessons from the Pandemic on Civil Liberties and uh, Social Justice. Uh, as I said earlier, Peter Jackson, who is the director of the Scottish Council of Global Affairs, will be one of the speakers. Another one will be Professor Adam Tompkins, who is a professor of public law, but of course was also an MSP at the time and challenged some of the regulation making. Uh, I know because I was making the regulations. And I think, it has a, I think it has the potential to address one of the other key issues, which is governments take powers to themselves during uh, global shocks, but do they give them back? Uh, and, do, and is there a position, uh, is there adequate scrutiny of that decision making? Uh, and I think it's going to be an interesting opportunity to discuss those issues, either in person or online. And it, th these are hybrid events. And then we will follow that on with a session on the economy. I think um, on the fifth of uh, you know, on the fifth of December, and then a final session that brings things together uh, sometime later in December. I think final date is still to be. Uh, 12th of December? 12th of December. Jean is, Jean is prompting me that it is on the 12th of December. Please take part online if you can. Thank you for being here and thank you for being online and thank you to our uh, contributors. <laughs>